All right, gang, uh, it took a while to get here, but uh, we're finally at chapter 13, Introduction to Multiple Regression, stat 1800, obviously. Um, let's, uh, let's get into the goals of this uh, video, uh, what I hope to teach you. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, but uh, a lot of this is non-calculation. Uh, you know, we're going to use stack crunch for calculations of the, uh, uh, the, the coefficients, um, so, uh, it, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the focus is on interpretations of the coefficient and, and just the overall picture, overall strategy of multiple regression. So uh, what I want to uh, try to teach you in this video is, um, you know, how do we come up with the coefficients? Uh, we're going to use stack crunch. Uh, second bullet, the interpretation of the coefficients is, is extremely important. Uh, the third bullet, uh, we want to be able to, to have a, a method by which we can use to uh, determine which predictors, which independent variables we should keep in the model. And then finally, how do we uh, uh, include a categorical uh, predictor in our regression model? So a lot, to, a lot going on here. So and I'll tell you, I've got a cold or allergies or something today, so I'm... Uh, uh, I'm struggling, struggling a little bit with the voice, so just bear with me. Uh, guys, the multiple regression model, <clears throat> uh, I, I think, again, the best way to think about the multiple regression model is to embed it in the simple linear regression model that we just finished. The simple linear regression model takes a y variable, a dependent variable, which is quantitative, and uses one uh, predictor, one typically one quantitative predictor. The multiple regression model just allows you to include two or more uh, predictor variables or independent variables. So from here on out, uh, predictor variable and independent variable are, are interchangeable. So guys, the model is just our, our y sub i uh, can be uh, explained by our model, which is that beta 0 plus beta 1 x1i one uh, plus beta 2 x2i uh, plus a, a random error term. Now, that's the overall model. That's the model that describes the relationship for the entire population. But when we start using uh, information from sample data, we create estimates of these, uh, these parameters. So you can see that we can estimate or predict the value of y uh, using the intercept, intercept, and then the estimated slope coefficients. And guys, again, we'll we'll, we'll use uh, stack crunch to um, to obtain these regression slope coefficients and other regression summary measures. Now, it, it, you know what, what what happens if you don't have stack crunch? Well, uh, the manipulation or calculation of coefficient for the multiple regression model are actually found using uh, matrix operations. It's really fun stuff. It's really cool stuff, but uh, not appropriate for uh, this class. So uh, let's dive into uh, an example. I think that's best in an applied statistics course like this one. Uh, don't spend time on, on theory. Let's just dive into an example. So uh, looks like here what we'd like to predict, uh, uh, which is our dependent variable, not to be con confused with a predictor, what we want to predict is predicted by predictors. So the, what we want to predict is our dependent variable. In this, it's the number of pies sold per week. And our predictors, our independent variables, are price of the pies and the amount of advertising in hundreds of dollars. So data was collected for 15 weeks. And you can see that uh, week number one, there were 350 pies that were sold. Uh, they sold at a price of $5.50 each, and the advertising was 3.3, but guys, that's in hundreds of dollars, so that would be $330 in advertising. So what we want to do is we want to fit a multiple regression equation where we can predict the number of sales based on two variables, the price of the, uh, of the pie and the amount of advertising in $100. Now, I've gone ahead and done this in Stack Crunch. It's something I'll show you how to do in, in future videos. And there's a, you know, there's a lot going on here. Uh, and I'm just going to run through this line by line. At the, at the very top, uh, you see that uh, uh, we have the equation, uh, the, the regression model, 
So sales and that upside down V like above sales just say this is the way we predict sales. So we can see it can be found. It's equal to 306.526. And guys, if you follow the line, you see that under the estimate, those are the beta coefficients. So 306.52, beside a price, you'll see negative 24.98. And beside of advertising, you'll see 74.13. So we put those values in for the betas. Uh, well, actually for the Bs, and then our variables are price and advertising. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, well, next step down, you'll see, uh, and again, let's go back to the parameter estimates. You can see that we have standard error column. We have alternative uh, hypothesis. Uh, we have degrees of freedom, test statistic, and p-values. Uh, we'll get into that uh, in one of the future videos. Guys, the analysis of variance table gives us kind of an overall fit for a model. The parameter estimates focuses on each, each predictor. The ANOVA table looks at the model comprehensively. Uh, so collectively, how do price and advertising uh, predict uh, sales? If you want to focus on price or advertising, then you go to the parameter estimates table. And guys, at the very bottom, you get into the summary of fit, uh, the things that are important there. Uh, most important are the R squared and the adjusted R squared. So we'll get into that uh, a little more uh, throughout the video, near the end of the video. So guys, interpreting the uh, multiple regression coefficients, uh, the B1 uh, price is negative 24.98. So we would say holding advertising constant. So the all the other variables in the model, if we can just hold those constant and kind of take their effect in sales out of the picture. Now, if we've got other variables that aren't in the model, that's, that's what we call noise. We don't know what they're doing in terms of predicting sales, but if we have a variable that we include in our model, such as we do in this one with price and advertising, then we can control, adjust the variation in those predictors and their effect on predicting uh, sales, in this case, of the number of pies per week. So focusing just on price, we would say holding advertising constant because it's the other variable. It's the only other variable. An increase of one unit, or in this case, one dollar, in price will decrease sales by $24.28. Now, uh, the interpretation of a beta coefficient, of a, a regression coefficient, is always as we increase that variable one unit, the B itself, the coefficient itself, gives us the change in our Y. And guys, that's huge. Let's, go, let's repeat that. When we increase our coefficient one unit, the beta, the B value, tells us how much the Y value will change. So again, since price is 24, well, negative 24.98, we say controlling for advertising, holding advertising constant. Advertising is no, no longer an issue. As we increase price one unit, and one unit in this case is $1, our sales decrease <clears throat> 24 point, uh, well, actually, that's, that, that's, a, that's not right. Um, I, f I found an issue there. It's not decreased by $24.98 because sales is in the number of pies. So that would be, uh, our, our, not our price would decrease, but our number of pies sold would decrease by 24.98. So that's... Uh, uh, that is a, uh, a mistake by your by your textbook. Uh, B2, <clears throat> same kind of logic, holding the other variable constant. In this case, it's price. Uh, so holding price constant, an increase of one unit. In this case, it's measured in hundreds of dollars. So uh, increase of $100 in advertising will increase sales. Again, not by $74.13, but by... 74.13 pies per week. So again, there's a, there's a typo by your textbook. 
So using the equation to make predictions, predict a sale for a week in which uh, the selling price is five fifty, dollars and advertising is three, $350. So guys, what we'll do is we'll insert $5.50 in for price. And we'll insert 3.5 because, again, advertising is in $100. So $350 is $3.5, $100. And we just multiply it out. Uh, guys, make sure you multiply first. Uh, so you'd multiply the negative 24.975 times 5.5. And then you'd multiply the 74.131 times 3.5. And then you would add everything. So our predicted sales for a week... Um, that's weird. They got this correct, uh, forty-two or four twenty-eight point sixty-two, and they didn't put the dollar sign there, uh, but they did before. So, uh, but anyway, uh, the predicted sales uh, for uh, a week, where the price is five fifty and advertising is three hundred fifty dollars, is four twenty-eight point sixty-two pies. Now we get into something called a coefficient of multiple determination. <clears throat> Guess the uh, the. R squared here, uh, it will be provided in the R output, and I'll show you that again in just a second. But it's just the total variation, or the percent of variation in Y, that's explained by the variation in the X variables. And it's easy to find because it's just the sum of squares for the regression. Sometimes that's called sum of squares for your model, uh, divided by the sum of squares for your total. So uh, you can see from the ANOVA table I have at the bottom, you can see the sum of squares for our model. Again, that's SSR. It's 29,460. The sum of squares for the uh, total uh, is 56,493.3. And if you multiply or divide that out, you get 0.52148. So we can say the 52.1% of the variation in pie sales is explained by the variation in price and advertising. Now, <clears throat> R squared uh, typically tends to uh, overestimate when we add additional variables. So because, and I'm not going to get into the mathematics behind this, uh, but when we add an additional X variable, R squared always goes up. Even if this X variable that we're, we're adding to our model has no impact whatsoever, uh, this R squared will just magically go up. Well, uh, that's problematic. So we need to come up with something better, and, and it turns out statisticians did years ago, called the adjusted R squared. So adjusted R squared uh, uh, essentially addresses the second blue bullet there. What is the net effect of adding a new variable? Did the new x variable add any, uh, uh, you know, power in uh, predicting the, uh, the, the, uh, the 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 dependent variable? So the um, R squared adjusted formula, yeah, it's a little messy, but uh, luckily for us, StatCrunch does all this uh, stuff for us. So again, what I want you to know to take away from this is. Uh, it penalizes excessive use of unimportant dependent variables. It's smaller than R squared every single time, and it's very, very useful in comparing uh, models. Um, and I mean, I don't mean models from two different research. I mean models uh, that have the same dependent variable, but different types of models trying to predict that. So different predictor variables, different sets of predictor variables. Well, guys, adjusted R squared and stack crunch. Uh, you can see it's in the summary of fit portion down at the very bottom. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's just given as R squared and then parentheses adjusted. So in our case, uh, for this problem, it's 0.44172. So what we would say is we would say that 44.2% of the variation in pie sales is explained by the variation in price and advertising taking into account the sample size and the number of predictors. Now, again, notice R squared adjusted is less than R squared because what I would say, what I would argue is that that R squared of 0.5215 is overinflated 
uh, and is not giving us uh, an accurate representation of the percentage of the variation in pie sales explained by our set of predictors. Next thing we uh, kind of once we shift our attention from the individual predictors, we move into looking at our to see if our model is indeed significant. And what we use here is we use an ANOVA test. Uh, we get an ANOVA output, and we call that the F test for overall significance of our model. And essentially, what this shows. Uh, it, it shows us uh, whether there is a linear relationship between all of the x variables and y. So the hypotheses here are the null is the beta 1 equal beta 2, uh, that all of our betas are equal. So in other words, there's uh, well equal to 0. So in other words, there's no linear relationship. And h sub 1, our alternative, says that each, uh, at least one of these is not equal to 0 for i equal 1 to k because we have k number of predictors so uh, we, we range that from 1 to k for obvious reasons. Now finding the f-test for overall significance guys it's the same as with ANOVA it's the same as with simple linear regression our f statistic is the mean square for our regression or the mean square for our model uh, divided by the mean square error term and uh, you can see that the mean square regression is just the sum of squares regression divided by uh, the number of predictors. And then the mean square error is just the sum of squares for the error divided by our sample size minus the number of predictors minus 1. So uh, in stack crunch, uh, we can see where all this stuff comes from. So we have uh, 2 and 12 degrees of freedom because uh, 2 is the degrees of freedom for a model because we have two predictors. Our error degrees of freedom is 12 because we have a sample size of 15 minus two predictors minus 1. So that gives us 12. And you can see that the F stat is found by dividing 14,730 by 2252 to get 6.54. Uh, our p-value, we guys, we've gone over that ad nauseum, how to calculate the p-value. It's just the area to the right in the F distribution. So it's the area to the right of 6.54 um, in the F distribution with degrees of freedom 2 and 12. So here's a handy-dandy little diagram that they provided. It's kind of cool. shows you the F distribution with degrees of freedom 2.12. 2 and 12 and it shows you that uh, the F critical is 3.885 and the F statistic uh, is 6.54 so it's to the right of that forcing it into the fail to reject region so there is evidence that at least one of our predictors uh, uh, significantly predicts Y or affects Y so guys, our assumptions. First of all, we focus on errors or residuals. Remember errors, uh, residuals are just the different be difference between the observed and predicted Ys. So our assumptions are that the errors are normally distributed, uh, that errors have constant variance, and that the model errors are independent. So guys, the way we check these, uh, we look at residual plots. We'll look at the residuals versus the predicted. We'll look at the residuals first versus our first predictor, residuals versus our second predictor. And guys, we get into any time series uh, analysis, we'll look at our residuals over time. Uh, I'm not getting into any residuals over or anything uh, over time in this this uh, this week, in this let's say in this chunk of videos. So uh, we'll get into that uh, into that later. And it'll be clear when we get into that because I'll tell you the purpose is to look at residuals uh, over time. So are individual variables significant? What we do there is we use individual t-test of the individual variable slopes. So we want to see if there's a linear relationship between each of our x's, each of our predictors, and y holding constant the effects of the other variables. So we can come in and perform individual hypotheses where H sub O, our alternative hypothesis, is that particular predictor has a slope zero. 
So there's no linear relationship. Our alternative hypothesis, what we get if our p-value is less than 0.05, is that the slope is not zero. There is a linear relationship between that particular predictor and the y. And guys, I understand this is a lot going on. Um, I don't know how many videos I'm going to have to put up to to cover this adequately, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll put up as many as I need to, but uh, I know there's a lot going on here. So uh, just an example, we would say that uh, our b sub j is equal to zero, uh, b sub j not equal to zero, the alternative, and we would come up with our test statistic with the degrees of freedom n minus k minus one, and then we would um, test that. Now, if you go back to the output, we can see that the test statistic for price was negative 2.306 with a p-value 0.04. And our t-stat for advertising was 2.855 with a p-value 0.01. So both of these test statistics have a p-value less than alpha, which means our decision is we would reject h sub o for both variables. Our conclusion from that, our interpretation of that decision, is that price and advertising are both significant in predicting pie sales. So guys, I can't imagine my life ever getting to a point where I really care about predicting pie sales, other than just to use it as an example here. But based on this data, based on the data from these 15 weeks, if I'm going to predict pie sales, um, it looks like uh, price and advertising are two very good choices. Now, guys, confidence intervals. Uh, again, we use stack crunch for the confidence intervals, so uh, <clears throat> uh, we don't really get into as much the, uh, the calculation, but I will put up in uh, a video uh, how to... Um, how to calculate the the uh, the confidence interval? It's really kind of easy because the b sub j, the the coefficient estimate, and the s b sub j over to the right, the standard error, those are included in the output. The t alpha over two is all you really have to find. That's just the critical value. And guys, quite honestly, we should be pretty good at that by now because we've been doing that stuff for a long, long, long time. Uh, so we should be pretty good at that. So anyway, uh, if you looked at just the 95% confidence interval for price, which is our X1, uh, 2.1788 would be your T critical. The 10.832, the standard error, was uh, from the output. And the negative 24.975 was from the output. So the interval uh, does not contain zero because, again, if it contains zero, we can't conclude that the slope is not equal to zero. So we must conclude that the slope is equal to zero. A lot of double negatives, a big old double negative there. Uh, so again, if the interval contains zero, we do not have significance. If the interval doesn't contain zero, we do have statistical significance. Now, a good way to think about that, and I know it's been a while, but think about <clears throat> confidence intervals for the difference of means. And there was a video put up. Uh, so if this is still a little iffy, you might want to go back and watch that this small portion of uh, confidence intervals for difference in means. So, uh, guys, uh, the interpretation. So uh, you will get a lower estimate and an upper estimate of the 95. Well, actually get lower bound and upper bound. So we would say holding advertising constant, again, holding the other variable constant. Uh, weekly sales are reduced between 1.37 and 4 point, or 48.58 pies per week for each increase of $1 in the selling price. That makes total, you know, imminent sense to me because, uh, you know, people are so price conscious often. Some people aren't. Some people are just totally financially irresponsible, but... Uh, you know, a lot of people are, are price conscious, and as you know, as things go up, uh, sometimes they make decisions not to buy, especially like things like pie. It's kind of different with gas, where we where we have to have gas, but uh, things that are kind of a, an add-on, like a pie, unless you have a, some sort of addiction to pies, uh, you know, you you could see where the price and the increase in price would have an effect on total number of sales. 
So finally, the last thing we're going to look at is called dummy variables. It doesn't mean that they're just dumb. It just uh, It's a name for a categorical predictor variable. So a dummy variable is a categorical uh, independent, actually, okay, is a categorical independent variable with two levels. So if we get into things where, you know, true or false, male or female is probably the most commonly uh, reported dummy variable. Again, a categorical independent predictor variable with two levels. Uh, so we coded zeros and ones. So there's some assumptions there. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, but... Uh, and if there are more than two levels, we have to get into uh, more than one dummy variable, but we don't get into that either. So we're just looking at the simplest case of where we have a categorical predictor variable with just two levels, true or false, this or that, uh, fail, not fail, succeed, you know, uh, gender, male or female. So guys... Um, Example here, let's let Y be the pie sales, X1 be the price. Instead of X2 being advertising, let's, ha let's let it be whether it's a holiday week or not a holiday week. So we've coded 1 as the holiday week and coded 2 as not a holiday week. That's very important when we interpret our coefficients. So guys, if we have this particular variable where sales is equal to 300 minus 30 times the price plus 15 times the holiday. Let's go through the interpretation. Let's go through B1 first, the 30. We would say controlling for holiday. As price goes up one unit, one dollar, then the number of pies sold per week decreases by 30. Now, let's dive into the holiday coefficient. The B2 is 15. Now, again... In general, the interpretation of a beta coefficient says as we increase one unit, what's the effect on the y variable, the dependent variable? Well, guys, in this case, increasing one unit means going from zero to one, which means we're going from a no holiday to a holiday. So we would say controlling for price Sales were 15 pies greater in weeks with a holiday than in weeks without a holiday. So this beta coefficient allows us to predict, this B coefficient, allows us to uh, make a prediction on sales, prediction on Y, based on a comparison of the two categorical uh, levels in the zeros and ones. Now, this is something I found. This is a, actually an SPSS output, but it's still the same. I want you to focus only on unstandardized coefficients. So if we come down to the column below the B, so our constant, which is our intercept, is 7.032. Socioeconomic status class of the home is negative 1.722, and gender is 1.198. How would we interpret these coefficients based on this model? Now, guys, forget all the stuff to the right. Forget, now you can look at SIG. SIG actually is a way that SPSS does p-values. So all of our p-values are significant. Let's just let's ignore all that right now. How would we interpret the coefficients, period? Forget everything else. Um, so SES is the uh, for the student's primary home, and gender is gender. Guys, I have no idea. I cannot interpret this. I can say, well... <clears throat> controlling for gender, if I'm looking at socioeconomic status, I can say controlling for gender as SES increases one unit, the, and the predicted standard score in the national test at age 14 decreases 1.722. Gender, I can say what? Controlling for socioeconomic status as gender increases one unit, the predicted standard score on national test at age 14 increases 1.198. But guys, I don't know how gender is coded. Is gender zero male, one female, or is one uh, male and, and uh, zero female? I don't know. So I dug a little deeper and I looked into what the coefficients are all, uh, 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 you know, what the, uh, the variable, predictor variables, how they're coded. And you can see what they've done here is they've taken socioeconomic status and they've 
they've given the highest socioeconomic status to the lower numbers. Which to me is kind of wacky, but let's step back from that. More broadly, as your statistics and uh, instructor in STAT 1800, I'm trying to actually teach you a couple of things here. First of all, I'm trying to teach you how to carry out statistical analysis. But secondly, and probably more importantly, that you can dive into other people's results and you know kind of have a clue, kind of have a you know basic understanding of what their results are telling you. So in situations like that, <coughs> you don't have control over the way they code their variables. I think this is insane. I would never code it this way. I would always code the higher number to be the higher level, but they didn't. So it kind of makes sense now that a decrease in or an increase in SES, which is <laughs> an increase in SES, which is actually a decrease in SES, um, leads to a lower score on <coughs> on the uh, score. Now, gender, we have zero coded as uh, male and one coded as female. So what we can now say is we can say, looking at socioeconomic status, we can say controlling for gender as socioeconomic class increases one unit, which oddly is a decrease, the predicted standard score <coughs> on a national test decreases 1.722. Gender, since we now know that male is zero and female is one, <coughs> oh, excuse me, guys, controlling for socioeconomic status, uh, females score 1.198 higher uh, on the standard score on national test at age 14 than do males. <coughs> Guys, this is ending at the right time because I'm having a coughing attack, so please accept my apologies on that. But, uh, you know, here's what we did. We, did, we tried to uh, accomplish those four goals, and uh, I think it'll become much clearer when we start crunching numbers and uh, looking at the other videos. So uh, take care.